All right, thank you. Our, our children ages uh, three to five. You can go now to <clears throat> children's church and their time together. And the rest of you can, um, actually the, the bulletin has the title of the message quite different from what you see on the screen. The history and meaning of crucifixion. Okay, I changed it in the bulletin to why the cross. And for some reason that color is blue and I had it red. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Is there a, I hope it's the same thing that I'm dealing with. Hope you got the right one. So, uh, so we're looking at today at the crucifixion in a unique and different way. Now, while you're turning to uh, Romans, which is the last passage we'll be looking at, Romans 5, 6 through 10, um, there's an event this coming Saturday night I encourage you to come to. Uh, Dr. St it's in your bulletin here, on, right underneath the sermon notes, and Dr. Stephen Collins will be here at 6 p.m. and be sharing with us what happened this year at the dig. You just got back last, this week, Monday, I think, and we want to uh, encourage you to come to that. He'll also be here next Sunday morning sharing with us, and he always has good, good presentation for us, I'm sure. Now, and mine's a little bit, uh, there's a lot in this presentation this morning, so uh, we want to uh, turn the lights down a little bit so you can see very clearly what's up on the screen. A lot of visual today. And also enough where I can see. We'll see. Okay. I think we have a good balance. How in the world did that turn blue? <laughs> I must have hit a strange button at some point. Um, <clears throat> the scripture we're reading today is beginning, I want to begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 23 and 24. And here's what it says. Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block. To Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now, why was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ viewed by some as nonsense, but by others as profound wisdom? That's always been a mystery throughout the centuries. It still is. And in order to understand this, we need to look at the history and the practice of the act of crucifixion itself. Now, the word cross comes from a Latin word. I think it's C-R-U-X, crux, and eventually led to uh, crucifixio, um, meaning, and we can see where crucifixion comes from. And it, we get our word excruciating from that. And when you hear someone say, well, I'm in excruciating pain, they're describing a word that came from the understanding of what happens on the cross. So uh, the Latin meaning, putting it all together, my understanding is, is actually fixed to a cross. So we want to begin historically. I want to take you back to the very earliest presentation or understanding of what it meant to be put on a cross or to be lifted up. And we need to go back to the Assyrians. They were a very, very brutal people. They even portrayed their gruesome practices in their art. So I want to look at one picture here. This is called the Lachish Relief. I hope that it's there. Yes, we're on the right track. All right, good. Even though it is blue on the other ones. Okay. Um, the the Re Lachish Relief was, uh, this was found in Nineveh. It's from around 700 B.C., and it's from the time of uh, uh, a, a time when Lachish was besieged by the Assyrians, and they made this, this as a uh, carving in stone, as a picture, it's an art form, of what they did to the people in Lachish. I want to, to look at some of the things happening here. This is only one instance. These guys, this is an impalement. These are the Assyrians. These guys are hanging on a pole, and it's being driven through them. They did this outside the city. Now, that's the first understanding we had. Now, they, this Lachish relief, you want to really be grossed out. 
Uh, they, there's another picture of them skinning people alive while the people inside are watching. Others are on fire. They're lifting them up. And this was, a, this, a, this was a very gruesome scene. So this is the first instance that we know of where it actually depicts someone actually being lifted up on a, on a pole in a form of what would be crucifixion, but not quite exactly the same thing. Now, there was another, if you look at the next scene, uh, King Sennacherib, who in his time, he bragged about what he did at another city of Ikron. And if you see what he said about that, he said, I assaulted Ikron and killed the officials and patricians who had committed the crime and hung their bodies on poles around the city or surrounding the city. So we're looking at a very brutal, brutal time. It's called impaling. Jesus had a form of impalement. He was on a cross when the Roman soldier stuck a spear through him while he's on the cross. Now I want you to understand what that meant. He went through under his rib cage, through his heart, and probably out his back. It was a, it was a brutal thing to put an end to his life, even to make sure he was dead. Now the idea of punishing a person by suspending them on a stake was accomplished in a variety of ways. The purpose was always the same though. It was to punish an adversary in as cruel a means as possible. That meant you were punished physically, mentally, and shamefully. Because generally speaking, they were stripped totally naked when they did this to them. It was with the intention of discouraging others from engaging in behavior for which the person was guilty of who's being publicly displayed. And it was intended to be a horrible punishment with a lot of pain and a dire warning to everybody else. Don't mess with us. Okay, we go into history. Down closer to us, we hit the time of the Persians. And from the 6th century and running over 200 years, the Greek historian Herodotus, he wrote about uh, this. You can read it with me. It should be on the screen. And that's the next one. And uh, it says, uh, thus was Babylon taken for the second time. Darius, having become master of the place, destroyed the wall, tore down all the gates, for Cyrus had done neither the one nor the other when he took Babylon. He then chose out nearly 3,000 of the leading citizens and caused them to be crucified, while he allowed the remainder still to inhabit the city. So we're going, you see where this is becoming quite common. And it was during this period that crucifixion came to be used for the lowest of low crimes. And again, Herodotus, he, he said it this way. He had previously, he's talking about what, what uh, uh, Darius had done. He still explained Darius. And he says that he, when he sentenced a man to be crucified, here's why. He says, this man had previously raped the virgin, for which reason King Xerxes intended to have him impaled. So it was a punishment. Say, you do this, you better, it's going to cause everybody else to think about doing it as well. We move down further into history. We get to the time of the Greeks, and everybody knows you've heard of Alexander the Great, 330 B.C. And after Alexander took the city of Tyre, uh, they had made it hard for him to conquer that city, and he was mad. He didn't like them standing in his way. So he poured out his wrath with a mass crucifixion. And here's uh, Quintus Curtius. He said it this way. He said, after the king, that the king's wrath furnished the victors with an awful spectacle, 2,000 men hung nailed to crosses along a great stretch of the shore. Well, after Alexander died, he uh, died in 323 B.C., and the land was divided among his generals. And the eastern section of his territory that included the Jewish homeland was called the Seleucid Empire. And the best known king was a guy named Antiochus IV, or Epiphanes. And here's how Josephus described his actions against the Jews who opposed him. We could put this one up on the screen. You can read it. It says, on which account they every day underwent great miseries and bitter torments. For they were whipped with rods and their bodies were torn to pieces and were crucified while they were still alive and breathed. They also strangled those women and their sons whom they had circumcised, as the king had appointed, hanging their sons about their necks as they were upon the crosses. And if there were any sacred book of the law found, it was destroyed, 
and those with whom they were found miserably punished as well. It was a hard time for Jews who wanted to be faithful to God. Well, you would think the Jews would say, well, that'll never happen to us. Well, guess what? The Jews themselves, they had learned about from their captors and uh, used it on their own people. After they had kicked out the Seleucids, Alexander Janius was a ruler from 103 to 76 BC. And after a civil war amongst the Jewish people, here's what Josephus wrote about how one Jew treated his own Jews who had fought against him. And you can read that with me too, bring that one up. I think we're still in the same place, yeah. And, and when he had taken the city <clears throat> and gotten the men into his power, <clears throat> he brought them to Jerusalem and did one of the most barbarous actions in the world to them. For as he was feasting with his concubines in the sight of all the city, he ordered about 800 of them to be crucified. And while they were living, he ordered their throats of their children and wives to be cut before their eyes. This was indeed by way of revenge for the injuries they had done to him, which punishment yet was of an inhumane nature. All right. Uh, what's so bad about all this? Even God looks down on it. If you look, uh, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23, and it'll be on the screen as well. It's an Old Testament scripture that reminds us of the seriousness of this method by putting someone to death, by lifting them up in whatever form. And it says, if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is cursed of God. So that you do not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Understand this. This was such a horrific thing to happen to someone that when it happened, it's as if God turns his back. He is, he, they're cursed by God because of the horrific crime they had to commit in order to be lifted up like that in this type of question. Now, whatever translation that is used concerning this Deuteronomy passage, the message is still the same. A hanging dead body is offensive to God. And that person was offensive to God. And the thinking then is that one who was crucified, whatever form that took, was at the lowest place of existence on the earth. And that, that begs us to ask a question. Again, why would Jesus be in such a low place in such low company? Well, let's move on in history. The Roman period. The Romans were the real masters of crucifixion and methods of brutality. Julius Caesar, after he, captured, well, after he had been captured by pirates in his earlier days before he became emperor, he, uh, he was abused. And he promised them, if I ever escape, I'm going to get even. And he did escape, and he swore to revenge, avenge his, his treatment. And Plutarch wrote of this, <clears throat> when he said Caesar paid no further attention to him because he was told not to go where they were, but he went anyhow, and he went to Pergamum. He took the pirates out of prison and crucified the whole lot of them, just as he often told them he would do when he was on the island if they, if they uh, imagined he was joking. Now, when the Jewish revolt took place in A.D. Uh, 66 to 73, <clears throat> Josephus related what happened to the Jews by the Romans. Here's what he said. He said, they were first whipped and then tormented with all sorts of tortures. Before they died, the soldiers, out of the wrath and hatred they bore to the Jews, they nailed those they caught to the crosses in different postures by way of jest. So he's just nailing them in all sorts of ways just to be mean to them. We know this about crucifixion. Convicts were executed by crucifixion in the Roman Empire as a matter of course. And histories of the time regularly describe the practice which was designed to make death prolonged, to make it painful, and to make it public. And after the famous slave uprising, uprising by Spartacus, you've read, seen the movie, Kirk Douglas, remember that one? He was, uh, it was crushed in 71 BC and, for example, an estimated 6,000 rebels 
were crucified along the Appian Way leading to the highway, uh, to the capital, as the uh, illustration of Roman power. Well, let's look at something now. What about crucifixion? We have a lot of writings about it. Uh, what about physical evidence that it ever happened in the first place? The only physical evidence of any crucifixion that has ever been found came out of a period called the Roman period during the time of Jesus Christ. And he's called the crucified man. Uh, he, he was found in an ossuary. Show the picture of what an ossuary is. An ossuary. It's, a, it's, it's just a box. Um, yeah, this one's a very special one, it's not, but it's an, it's an ossuary. It's a bone box. When someone died, they would place them in a tomb, and then a year later, they'd go back in and collect the bones and put them in boxes like this. And this was uh, the only, this evidence for crucifixion was found in one of these boxes. And show the next slide, and you'll see what that evidence is. It's a heel bone. You have a nail that was put through the heel bone, and the, it, it bent, and it, uh, they couldn't get it out, so they just kept it in there. And some scholars used to think that the crucifixion story was contrived because there was no real archaeological evidence of crucifixion during the time of Jesus Christ. It was also thought that such victims were only thrown into common graves and not give proper burials. And that kind of goes against what the Bible says about Jesus going into a well-known man's tomb, uh, a rich man's tomb after his, for his burial. But in, in 1968, archaeologists found this uh, in ossuary, and it contained the bones of a man whose name was written on it. His name was Yoanan or John Ben Hagagol. Hagagol, I don't know. Hagagol. Hagagol, I got it. And uh, in, in, a, in northern Jerusalem. And it was contained in a tomb that had 35 of these. And they, we think they used them in uh, these ossuaries in order to condense space so more family members could be buried in the same tomb. So John was killed by crucifixion sometime between 07 AD and, or AD 7 and 70. And he still had this four and a half inch nail in his right heel. His legs had been broken by brunt force, boom, boom, on both sides. And now that's consistent with scripture. Remember, they did that to both the men on either side of Jesus, the thieves. Jesus, they did not break his bones to fulfill scripture because he was already dead. And they, his feet were nailed to the side of the cross uh, individually. Now, it's a, uh, look at the next slide. Okay. Now, this is uh, interesting what it uh, looks like. It's, it's, it's possible that his, uh, what you've got happening here is that you have a, like a piece of olive wood was found here, and as he was nailed in, that kept him from pulling his foot off the cross. Now, show the next one. This is a diagram of what it probably looked like when a man was crucified during the time of Jesus. We usually have pictures of Jesus with his feet like this and a big, long, nine-inch nail. This one had on both sides. He was nailed like this and like that. Now, when they, if they really wanted to prolong the agony, they tied you to a cross. The most merciful thing they could do was nail you to a cross because that would, that would quicken your death. So what are we getting at? Uh, this confirms that some victims were nailed to the cross, just like Jesus was. Confirms the victims of crucifixion could be granted a proper burial, just as Jesus was. Confirms that victims of crucifixion would routinely have their legs broken before their death, just like the Bible says. And again, though, we come to this question. Why did Jesus die such a death as this? And why did early Christians then use the cross as a badge of honor and faith at a later time. You see, here's the amazing thing about the cross. It took them almost 400 years after the crucifixion of Jesus before anyone would wear a cross or anyone would display a cross or anyone would have it in an art form. It was a such a horrific thing, they would not even display it in literature or in art. Like, not like we do today. Today we have one back here in the baptistry. See, it's quite pretty. That would not have been in an early church. Wouldn't have been there. 
early Christians, here's, you know, the, I'm going to show you the earliest depiction in art, a form of art, of a cross. This goes back to 200 A.D. or A.D. 200. Show that, show that picture. Okay, it's, it's a, a graffiti on a wall, and it says, Alex, Alex Menos worships his God. Do you see what they've done with the cross? They put a donkey's head on top. This is supposed to be Jesus on the cross. Here's Alex Menos worshiping him, and they put a donkey's head on top. Just as Paul said, it was a mockery. That's the earliest portrayal of a cross in art that you find. Well, it took several centuries for the image of a cross to be acceptable in art and jewelry. jewelry. The, the earliest is found in the next image. Um, after Constantine in 312 AD had a vision before the Battle of Milvian, uh, the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome, he, he said that Christ appeared to him and told him if he used this image as a standard or flag for battle, he will win. He used it, and he won against impossible odds. He's outnumbered four to one. And this is called a labrum. labrum. Um, you see what it is. You have the first two letters of the name of Jesus Christ. You have a key and a row. Now, what this would have had on it down here would have been a cross beam, and a standard uh, would be there. Uh, proclaiming Alpha and Omega. Uh, and, and today, you find them many times with Alpha, the beginning, and Omega at the end in that area. But that's the first indication that a cross was made public and glorified the cross. And that became the standard for Constantine from there on. Uh, let's show one more that we got here. This then is art. And this goes back, this is it, as far as when you find Jesus actually hanging on a cross. This didn't happen until 420 A.D., it, nobody did anything like this until 8420. And this is a panels on a box. And you'll see it's interesting because it also includes Judas. He's being hanged. And it's like Jesus is almost alive. And some think that he's saying, well, Judas is dead, but Jesus is alive even, even when he's dying. Uh, I don't know if that's what it is or not. I think it's just a portrayal. You don't have anything happening to his feet. You have a beardless Jesus in this portrayal. You also have the, uh, at this time, you have the nails in the palms. We know that was not possible. It went here. 20, 30 pounds of body weight pulls them out. So another one I'm going to show you, have, they have the nails in his fingers. So they didn't really know anymore. It's been 400 years. They didn't know. But that's the first portrayal you have. Show the next one. And this is the doors of Santa Sabina in Rome. And this you have a posture that's really different. You can hardly see the cross. You can see the top there. They see the born there. You see there's where, see where the nails are? You have a bearded Christ this time, and the posture is one of prayer and praise on all three of them. And that became a posture that was imitated in art from there on of uh, early Christian saints going in this direction. It's uh, kind of strange, but at least they're showing the crucifixion. Now we go one more, two centuries later, in the 6th century, this is a lid of a uh, box from Sancta Sanctorum in, in the Vatican. And uh, you, you see, it's, it's, uh, here is the crucifixion, fully clothed, and that's Jesus with a cross above him. And it's getting kind of confusing. And from there on, the crosses became prettier and prettier and prettier. Jewelry, gold, everything, the cross was then adored. All right. Jewelry today that we wear, some of you may be wearing a cross, would have, uh, it would have been very odd for you to wear that in a few hundred years after Jesus Christ was born. I mean, crucified um, in early Christianity. So the question then remains, and we're going to get into it now, real quick. And that is very simple. Why did Jesus go to the cross, why did he die such a death? In order to understand that, go to the Romans passage. And I'm not going to comment a whole lot on this, just to let you know the answer here. It's a perfect outline as to why Jesus died. And it's, it's 
first of all, let's read Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. And it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were yet sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. First point is that we are powerless to do anything about our sin. Why did Jesus have to go through such a horrible thing? Because we don't have any power whatsoever according to this. Our sin is really bad. It's, uh, and people who think I'm going to be okay, I'll take my chances at judgment, they are in for a great big disappointment because they are powerless according to this verse, to do anything at all about their sin. An animal sacrifice was not sufficient. No sacrifice we can make today is sufficient to atone for our sin. Only the cross with Jesus Christ on it, took the, when he took our place there, that was what was necessary. We're powerless. Second point, God's great love for us. Why did Jesus die? I always love this verse, Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? What amazing love. The fact that he knew we were sinners. In spite of that fact, Christ died for us. He knew us at our worst, and he still went to the cross for us. It's the love of God. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And then the third thing, why did Jesus die on the cross? To save us from God's wrath. In verse 9. We talk a lot about the love of God, but the opposite end of that is the wrath of God. If you do not want to be embraced by God's love, you will experience his wrath. And why did Jesus die? It's because our sin was so horrific that God was going to bring his wrath upon us because of that. But Jesus paid the penalty, so the wrath of God actually was focused on his own son on the cross. Christ experienced the wrath of God for you. That's why I tried to show you how horrible this cross stuff is. Spent a lot of time at it. It's to show you why. Because that's the wrath of God upon Jesus Christ because of you. The next point's quite simple. Why did Jesus die? To bring reconciliation between God and man. You see, we were enemies with God because of our sin. And God wants us to be reconciled. He wants peace. And that's the only way it could happen was through his son, Christ, dying on the cross. The fifth thing, why did Jesus die on the cross? To give us life. The Bible describes us as walking dead men and women until we have real life in Jesus Christ. He came that we might have life and have it abundant. But if you do not have Christ, you're not even alive. So it's important that we recognize Jesus died in order for us to live. And then the, there's, a, there's a song, isn't there? A, how's that go? Because He Lives. Remember that song? Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives, All Fear Is Gone. Because I Know He Holds the Future. And life is worth the living just because He lives. Final point, and this is uh, very important, and it's, it's another reason to praise God. See that last verse there in verse 11? And not only this, Paul says, but we exult, meaning we, we erupt in an attitude of praise to God. We exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So, God wants us to praise him this morning because of what he did for you and me. So the, the question comes back, why did Jesus die on the cross? It's because of you. It's because of me. That is the ultimate answer. And God loves you so much 
that he doesn't want you to experience wrath. Let's close with this verse on the screen. And you can, I'd like for you to read I think we should read this one together. It comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let's read it together. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality of God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. Do you see the digression, the lowering of Jesus Christ? You, you, you have him, first of all, he was in the very nature God, and he left, he didn't, didn't consider that to be something to hold on to, but then he says he lowered himself to become the nature of a servant in human form. And then it says, and found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself again to go to uh, be obedient to death. And not just death, he humbled himself again to a certain type of death, the cross. Why did he do it? For you. It's for you. So you need to receive Christ if you have not, before it's everlastingly too late. If you have received Christ, you need to praise him. Have the worship team come on up. We're going to sing a song and close us today. If you need to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, please come. Uh, I'll be up here. Les will be here. Duba's here. We have all kinds of people around to help you in this time. But this, here's the words of the song. Above all powers, by the way, this is Michael W. Smith. He sang that at Billy Graham's funeral. And uh, he says, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, Above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. And then the chorus, crucified, laid behind a stone. You live to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. Let's stand together.